We can begin proceedings. Welcome to the second meeting of the Media Workers CV19 Crisis Group. And joining us today, we have four very excellent, excellent speakers. Um, and we also have a teacher from Hackney who will be kicking off um, this event to set the scene. And if I could just start by introducing our other speakers, um, we're all, um, I could be fair to say, our leaders in their fields, respectively. Um, John Parrington is the Associate Professor um, at, at uh, Oxford University of uh, Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology. Megan Povey, who's a Professor of Food Physics at Leeds University. Charlotte G, who's from um, MIT Technology Review, a most august title. And John Lister from Health Campaigns Together and the editor of Lowdown, a fortnightly newsletter soon to be launching. I believe. Um, but before we get into tonight's meeting, which is on the subject of COVID-19, journalism, science and fiction, um, we heard quite a lot of fiction, I would argue, yesterday from the Prime Minister of Great Britain, um, one Boris Johnson. Um, I gather we are competing with at this very moment in time, so please catch us on the recording on YouTube. Uh, those will, will miss it, because they want to hear from um, the PM trying to make amends for the disaster of a news conference, or whatever it was he did yesterday, spreading a lot of fiction. But before we get to that, and before we get to our four main speakers, Jane Bassett, who is a, a teacher in Hackney, and I think a member of the committee of uh, NEU, the Teachers Union, will say a few words, um, because the teachers are in the eye of the storm, as it were. Jane, over to you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'll be very short. I'm going to say I'm a secondary teacher, and I think the people who are most immediately in the eye of the storm actually are primary school students and their families um, because of the appalling announcement that Johnson made yesterday. Our General Secretary, Mary Boosted, came out immediately afterwards with a press release which described it as reckless, um, the government's proposals. As you probably know, they want to bring back immediately after half term or, quote, as soon as possible year one and year six um, and then going on to secondary students later in the term. I think the reaction from many primary uh, teachers and educators but also from many many parents is both fury and fear because actually it is as Mary said it is an utterly reckless um, decision and policy if you can call it that. It is also dangerous, it puts everybody involved in schools, their families and the children at risk. If I think about the situation in Hackney, for example, we had the third highest level of COVID deaths in the country. Um, we have a pretty high number of households with intergenerational um, families, hence children going home and, talking, and taking it back possibly to their grandparents, and a very high population of um, black, black people from various different communities. And we've all seen, of course, the statistics to do with the deaths in those communities and the appalling disc discrimination that we've, we've actually seen at work there. Therefore, we, th we think that it is incredibly dangerous to go back to schools and it's utterly impossible. If you think particularly about primary schools, five-year-olds do not understand social distancing. It's as simple as that. They want to talk, they want to run around, they want to cuddle each other, they want to jump on their teachers, they want to roll around, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, and I, th I think as teachers and as educators, support staff as well in schools, it's we, you know, we want to be back at school, but we want to be back at school when it's safe. And at the moment, the union has cut out, um, put out five very clear tests, which actually say this is what would make it safe going back to school. As far as we're concerned at the moment, none of those have been met. We've had a huge reaction. The parents' petition put out yes, um, at seven o'clock yesterday it had, I think, 55,000 signatures. It's now got over 400,000. Um, the TUC, with all the joint unions, including what the NEHT, one of the head teacher unions, have expressed extreme concerns about that. We are going to fight to actually stop this. It is dangerous, it's destructive, and, and it will harm our students, their families, and schools. And I think, you know, you hear a lot of hypocrisy from government about being concerned about these students. I think we need to go back and say, well, why have you cut huge amounts of money from education over the past um, few years? Um, why have you not put the money into, for example, special needs education? Please don't tell us we don't care about our students. We are the ones who care about our students. We want to educate them. We want to see them safe at um, when they come back to school. In the meantime, safe at home, 
not coming, not for example, traveling into school on overcrowded buses. And for people who live in London, the pictures in on the tube today, for example, are horrendous. Um, so yeah, please support everything you can if you've got children. Um, or if you know people who've got children, I'm sure you do, please ask them to join it in, attend local meetings and build up the resistance to this. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jane, for those remarks. And as you say, um, infants are in the eye of a storm. Um, and there's been lots of discussion about whether or not, uh, just as one example of uh, the science we're all trying to get to grips with, uh, whether or not um, kids are um, people are, are transmitting the disease, particularly. Um, there's something in the Washington Post today suggesting that that is the case because in New York City, something like 66% of those who are being hospitalized from COVID are shielding at home. So they're getting it from someone at home and um, it looks like it could well be the kids. So that could be a huge vector. So that's opening the door to a definite second wave, but I'm no expert, but we are here today to talk about talk with experts and to ask the question from the point of view of journalists and others, um, how do we actually get to the truth? Um, how do we distill fact from fiction um, and the politics that is uh, um, very much at the forefront of all of the discussions around this subject? Um, and as I say, John Parrington, professor at uh, Oxford University, is a research in this very field, heads up a lab, so he knows everything there is to know about viruses. So hopefully um, John can help us uh, to get the unvarnished truth about what the situation really is. Uh, over to John for some opening remarks. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, well, as well as working at Oxford University for quite some years, I also spent six weeks, which is not long really in journalism standards, but working at the Times as a journalist. So I think I can sort of see things from the point of view of um, journalists reporting science, as well as being a scientist, um, cutting edge of uh, molecular biology. And I think one of the things that's worth saying, actually, before we start is that uh, we're all learning about this. So, so although I do know a lot about viruses, one thing we're learning a lot about COVID and the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the COVID disease is just how many unusual and uh, interesting and fascinating things there are, apart from this also means people are dying. And I think that's why we need to be always looking at the changing situation if we're going to make sense of what's going on. Um, so I think one of the first things to say is that this is without doubt, it's an unprecedented situation. Uh, in the developed world, at least there's quite some decades that we've faced this kind of situation. Um, I think the, the latest global deaths, reported deaths, so it's probably far more than this, is 283,000 people have died uh, of COVID. Of course, you could say that, you know, other infectious diseases kill about 70 million people around the world um, every year, and we often don't hear about them. That's something in itself to think about. The difference, of course, is that those diseases tend to kill people in the global south, people with dark skin. One of the big differences about COVID is that it's had its hit uh, right at the heart of, 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 of the developed world. And I think this is why it becomes such a major situation because one of the intriguing things about this virus is that for many people, um, it isn't a particularly um, harmful virus. You know, I think it's 83% of people at least have such a mild response to, COVID, to, to, to the virus that they don't show any that they don't show enough symptoms to, for it to go reported. But clearly, there are quite a, a significant number of people out there who are incredibly uh, vulnerable to this disease. And I think that's where we face a doubly dangerous situation in the sense that some people are clearly uh, incredibly vulnerable. They say it's as bad as Ebola for those people. We're talking about um, mainly elderly people, but also people with existing uh, health conditions, people who are overweight. We're already seeing that there's, there's uh, very worrying differences in terms of black and ethnic minorities, um, people in, uh, 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 um, in less paid jobs, all these things are major factors. We're just starting to get to understanding why the virus is, is affecting these people in particular. Um, but I think one of the most dangerous things about this virus is the very fact that it can be uh, so in, asymptomatic in so many people means that it's spread with, with, with a kind of rapidity that you, you wouldn't have seen if it had been, you know, uh, something like Ebola that, that tends to, you know, kill a much you know, greater number of people. And clearly what we, I think we also got to put, to say when we're reporting, um, you know, what the government says, what it says it's doing, you know, all the rest of it, 
is how differently the situation could have been if it had been handled in a, in a different way. So really, um, I mean, I think the UK government in particular, but you know, governments around the world simply didn't recognise the threat of, um, of the situation as, as quickly as they should have done. It was quite clear when it first, there was the first outbreak in, in China that this was a really serious uh, virus that was definitely going to spread if, if left unchecked. And one of the really tragic things about the situation is the way it was allowed to enter countries, it was allowed to spread around countries uh, it, without any kind of real uh, prevention by, by governments until it was far too late. And, and as we've seen even now, even now we've had the lockdown, which has been incredibly effective in, in many ways in stopping the spread of the disease um, once it first got a hold and, and also preventing even more deaths than, than we've seen, though that it's absolutely tragic the number of deaths that we've, we've had in this country already which could have been prevented. Uh, there's now talk about, you know, releasing the, the lockdown in ways that don't really bear scientific scrutiny. Um, so, I mean, we, we, we can, you know, we can joke about the incompetence of the government and the rest of it. Clearly, there's, uh, it, it's, it, it's a farce in, in one sense, but a complete tragedy in the others uh, in, in the ways that they are um, reacting to this. Uh, and I think certainly in terms of what, as, as journalists and as, as interested parties, in how we sort of report this or talk about this, I think it is very important to um, to look at the change in science. I think that's been an important thing. I mean, certainly when it first arose in China, I think it was generally thought there was only really elderly people that are at risk. Well, clearly that's not true. There's, there's clearly a whole layer of other people under 60 who are at risk as well. And I think that has a big impact in what we say about what the safe kind of measures that a government should be taking. Um, um, and I think the other thing to say is that we need to be learning from the changing science and we need to point in the finger back at the government to say, well, look, the science says this uh, and, and so on and so forth. I, I, I've certainly found the Science Media Centre to be a very useful source of information, mainly because experts in science can then um, share their views on, the, on that uh, base. And, and as a source of um, quotes and as a source of information, I think it's been very important, really. One thing that worries me quite a lot, actually, about Johnson is that maybe I'm, I'm being too charitable to him. Of course, you could just say he's incompetent, is a bumbler. But one thing that worries me quite a lot about the government's response is there is actually a strategy here. So even you know, right from the start, we saw that they were willing to try and pursue this line where, um, in the name of so-called herd immunity, a complete misuse of the term, this idea that we could somehow get immunity developing in the community. Uh, what I think there was a sense there, at least among some of the sort of government advisors, was that certain people were dispensable. So right from the start, we saw that. And I think even now, in terms of um, um, releasing the lockdown or easing the lockdown, there's definitely a sense of, of the government trying to, I think, divide people in the country against each other. Because to be quite honest, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are hurting in a really bad way um, because of the lockdown. You know, there are lots of people who are not being covered by the government uh, aid and the rest of it. And, and clearly there's a huge pressure on people, you know, to, 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 to go back to work. There's clearly a pressure in the sense that people's employers are also putting pressure on them. And I suspect in the next few weeks, that's going to lead to real, um, you know, uh, divisions if we're not careful. Um, we can see already, you know, how, how, how things have started to change. Even today, you saw those pictures of packed tubes in London and the rest of it. So clearly, I think on the one hand, the unions are playing an absolutely crucial role here in, in determining what is safe and what is not about a workplace to return to. And I think also we do have to keep returning to the science and, and what the scientists are saying, because I think one of the important things that certainly come out of the last few days is how many scientists are opposed to uh, the way the government's trying to portray itself as being guided by the science. But clearly what they're proposing in terms of the easing of the lockdown is, is completely going against scientific principles about what is sensible and safe to do um, in terms of con you know, uh, containing this, this virus. Um, so I think that's probably money what I wanted to say uh, for now anyway, but uh, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, okay, over to Megan Povey, Professor of Food Physics at Leeds University. Megan. Hi. Um, 
just being invited to this meeting did remind me that I've actually I edited a newspaper for asbestos workers in the 1970s and later on I edited for a short time a paper called Science for the People um, but uh, I certainly wouldn't regard myself as a journalist now um, when I when I heard um, the Chief Medical Officer of Britain, Sir Philip Valance, talk about herd immunity, I was deeply shocked because this, this is a abysmal piece of, of uh, social Darwinism. It, 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 it's not science. <laughs> I mean, actually, you, you, know, you have to ask yourself the question, well, herds have been wiped out by disease completely. I mean, uh, there is no guarantee that there is any immunity in a herd. So it's not just pseudoscience. I mean, it's it's kind of cover up for the government, this ne neoliberal discourse and this these neoliberal forms of thought. You know, the idea of war of all against all, the um, survival of the fittest, which, which allows our rulers to take no responsibility whatsoever because these social Darwinist ideas simply allow events to take place. Now, of course, they don't believe it applies to them because, <laughs> you know, so there's a real dose of hypocrisy in this. But, um, uh, you know, when Sir Philip Valance made this statement, he, he, he gave scientific credibility to an incredibly discreditable idea and provided intellectual cover for um, vile Tories, not just BJ, but listen to Toby Young, who said, the majority of people whose lives could have been saved only have one or two years left and these will not be good years. It isn't worth spending 185 billion to save them, nor is it worth a 15% drop in GDP. Now, I mean, I mean, you know, this is crude and brutal and dangerous, uh, but of course it's also ignorant because a lot of the people who, are, um, who contract the disease end up themselves in a much, much worse place, needing lifetime healthcare. I mean, I know people who have been in ICUs for weeks and will never emerge uh, anything like the, the, the um, way they were. So, um, uh, you know, and I think you have to look at Sir Philip Valance himself, you know, the chief medical officer of Britain formerly chief executive of GlaxoSmithKline. So he shares these um, neoliberal ideas because they suit companies that make profit through deceit and uh, lies, you know, just as BJ and the Tories managed to get into office by lying and they, they're just used to it. They, they are practiced deceivers. And now, of course, they still think they can do this, except that facts are beginning to become rather awkward. And, um, you know, I, and I think when you, when you look at the way in which scientific ideas, so BJ talked about the R factor, which is the replication rate, uh, last night to give a kind of um, scientific credibility to the brutality of what he was an ignorance of what he was saying um and you then you look at him sending primary school teachers into reception classes now in the ons report that came out today which in, in many respects uh, supports the neu's position that um primary school teachers are at least as uh, uh, as much at risk as health workers you, you look at carefully at that one of those um, graphs, it actually categorizes um, primary school teachers as um, being able to distance themselves, i.e. not actually in contact 
Now, in fact, if they send uh, reception classes back, they will be at the same risk as dental nurses who are at the highest risk of all. And, and this is incredibly dangerous because children are by and large an asymptomatic vector for the disease. There's a really interesting article in Nature, which I've shared on the chat about that. And um, what this will mean is there'll be a sudden expansion in the rate of transmission of the disease into families and towards older people. And I think, you know, this will mean that whilst at the moment, it, the Britain is the second worst place in the world for deaths per million. Um, and just being caught up by Sweden, by the way, who are operating a very similar, uh, even more brutal in some ways, plan. Um, that what we unfortunately may well see is what is at the moment roughly a plateau. You know, the, the idea it's going down at the moment is rubbish. You know, if you if you take all the possible errors and uncertainties in the in the situation, we may well see it going back up. That's happening in Belgium. It's happening in Sweden as we speak, and this. I mean, I just, um, anyway, so just to go on to the, what I've been asked to talk about, which is what can um, journalists do about this? I think, you know, John's right. We have to take the science seriously. We have to uh, engage with the science, but at the same time, people who are not scientists can ask very simple questions that are very penetrating ones. For example, about that graph in the ONS report, why are primary school teachers classed as able to socially distance when in a reception class, it is absolutely impossible. You cannot wear PPE in a reception class. They're in an even worse situation than dental nurses. The, you know, Jane has already made this point, but you, you can't have PPE and distancing. And this will feed right back into the entire um, into the entire pandemic, and, and you know transmission mutation rates, transmission rates are proportional to the populations, and they're pro proportional to contact rates. And Johnson has just announced that he is going to increase that rate by the biggest way that could be possible. I mean, it's just crazy. So journalists, on the one hand, need to be asking simple questions, just looking at obvious flaws and paradoxes in the data, but also realizing that what is scientific in one field can and often is pseudoscience in another. Finished. Thank you very much, Megan. Um, if I could just draw people to see that article that you've um, put in the chat from Nature. How do children spread the coronavirus? The science still isn't clear. Um, and that could go through an awful lot about uh, what is, after all, a novel um, coronavirus. That means it's new. <laughs> There's sort of a hell of a lot we don't know. And um, all of us uh, are, trying to, are struggling with that. Uh, no more so than in the media. Um, I'm a financial journalist, a money observer, and we watch the markets go up and down on the basis of how drugs are performing. So this is remdesivir. Um, the market went up by trillions of, uh, well, billions rather, of, uh, of dollars the other day because uh, people thought this antiviral could be some sort of cure. Um, so we have Charlotte G here, who's a reporter for MIT Tech Review, um, and she'll explain some more about uh, the difficulties, I guess, of trying to report this subject, which is a moving target, uh, something we know not that much about, and it's all evolving in real time before us. So, Charlotte. Very much so. Um, thanks, Gary, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so as you said, I'm a reporter for MIT Technology Review. Obviously, it's an American publication, so I have a bit more of a slant towards the US for, for what I'm reporting on. Um, and, you know, I would say that's even more of a horror show than it is here, which is which is saying quite a lot. Um, 
who would have thought that that voting in people who don't care about human beings would have ended badly um but anyway to to get more to the point uh before I continue, actually, the point about kids is a really, really important one. Um, I, in fact, I was just looking at another paper which came out today. Um, I can't remember which which uh, which of the publications it was in, but it's a pretty reputable paper. And it said not only is there evidence that kids can um, carry and pass on the virus, but there is actually a really serious inflammatory syndrome that children are now starting to present with. So it looks like not only can children carry it, but they can they can get it and quite badly. So I, I'm actually, I'm very worried about kids going back to school. I don't think they should be going back until the very earliest September. I think um, we need to be really cautious. Um, I also strongly suspect that, that the UK will have a second wave because um, if you look at South Korea, they've reopened bars um, and restaurants and they're now having a ton more cases and having to go back into lockdown, which um, which brings its own, its own issues because of course it's very damaging for businesses having to re-lockdown and have more uncertainty yet again um but yeah i think overall what i'd say about this virus is that it's exposed a huge gap between those who claim knowledge and those who actually have it so anyone who says that they know everything about coronavirus is either lying or they're a fool because the pandemic is so huge in its scope it's literally impossible for one person to to be all over it and i say that as someone my job is to read the news every day collate it all into a newsletter which I send to people as well as doing my own reporting and I there's tons of things that I don't know about it and tons of stories that I haven't seen about it so I think it the, what's valuable during this crisis is for journalists to be humble and to acknowledge what they don't know and get an expert on the phone and ask them about it rather than trying to just muddle along and and you know make it up because you you really can't this is a very this is pretty black and white you either know something or you don't know it. Um, and this has really exposed, exposed that. Um, frankly, it would also be good for you know, politicians to admit when they don't know things too. Um, but quite a lot of these people seem to pathologically be incapable of doing that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, as you know, I think Megan mentioned, um, the UK is now second only to the US in terms of deaths. And it's it's difficult to cover this because, you know. It, it's hard to, to deal with being exposed to that scale of human suffering every day. And, and, you know, that can really take a toll. I know lots of journalists who are incredibly stressed, got lots of anxiety, lots of depression. Pe people are definitely struggling with it. Um, and it's really becoming important that people do, I know this phrase is a bit, a bit kind of cliche, but use self-care and, and know when to stop and don't just pull crazy shifts. Um, Unfortunately, on the other end, you have editors and bosses at newspapers pushing people to to do that. So to keep working hard because all their other colleagues are you know, laid off on furlough. It's a pretty it's a pretty messy situation right now in in, um, in papers. Um, there has been some really good journalism during this. Um, the Guardian's been been pretty good. Um, they did a fantastic sort of expose of the early response to the crisis recently. Um, where they looked at the policy of herd immunity um, and kind of how how that how that ended up being uh, a phrase that was used. Um, I think the thing with the government is is that you know they for a long time they were really asleep at the wheel. I think that the idea was that they came in they want Brexit was the thing they were going to be famous for and they really didn't want to let go of that. Um, and it's really inconvenient of this virus to have come along and derailed what they'd planned. And I think that partly drove the reluctance to really engage with it. I think there was a real degree from Johnson of just, you know, just pretend this isn't happening. Unfortunately, that isn't how global pandemics work. So or the, the net effect of that is that the UK locks down, I'd say, probably two weeks too late. Um, you look at things like the Atletico Madrid match with Liverpool, you look at Cheltenham, we will look back at these and they'll be seen as huge preventable humanitarian disasters, I think, in the in the inquiries that we have about this. Um, and I think it, it's interesting, I don't really know what the current strategy is. It's quite hard to understand and I say that as you know, someone who's following this very closely. Um, I, I do wonder whether this sort of misleading phrase herd immunity isn't still the strategy 
but it's just not being admitted. I don't know. I don't want to get too tinfoil hatted. Um, and I'm also fascinated by the phrase guided by the science, given that covering working for a global news, you know, news organization, I can see that the science is very different in other places. So that's that seems a bit of an odd one. Um, but I was going to talk a little bit about the topic that I've been covering during this, and I've been writing about uh, mental health a lot and the impact of the pandemic on mental well-being at a kind of population level. One thing I wrote about was the basically the long term impact on uh, of being on a ventilator and being in an ICU and that we need to prepare and give support to people who who are going to be coming out of that that situation i think we are going to be hit with a huge spike in in um, diagnosable mental illness and i think that unfortunately it's going to be happening at a time when the nhs is really really unprepared for it and badly underfunded and mental health's always been a bit of a bit of a sort of uh, second fiddle so that that is a concern I think that this crisis has, has definitely shone a spotlight on journalism. I think, as I've said, there has been good practice. The Guardian, the Atlantic's been been pretty good. And I would humbly say MIT Technology Review has been, been pretty good too. But there's also been you know, lots of ways that journalists have, have fallen short. I think that the press conferences have exposed some really, uh, frankly, just people who are just not good enough working in, in news organisations. And it's also exposed the really cosy way that the media can work with anonymous government briefings, who everyone jokes are Dominic Cummings, um, press conferences that only the lobby can attend, and frustratingly, a sort of a sense that it's, it's really a kind of stitched up deal and that the media's job is to basically trumpet the government line which I think we have to push back against in the strongest terms. It's never been our job to, to basically say, you know, the government is great, everything it does is great. Our job is to pick through what they're doing, criticise it where warranted and, and expose what's, what's happening. Um, yes, and I think the other thing I was going to say, it's also more important than ever that people can trust the accuracy of what's being reported. And that comes back to my original point about why that means we need to be humble. If we don't know something, we need to be clear about it. And bluster is not, not what we need right now at all. Um, I think I'd just sort of sum up by saying that there, there's a real um, wave of, that there's a real crisis coming to hit newsrooms, I think, soon, because advertising revenues are dropping really rapidly, and that's going to decimate already very cut to the bone newsrooms. I think there'll be lots of layoffs. There's already been quite a few layoffs. Um, I don't know how many journalists on furlough will be coming back. And it's easy to kind of, there's so many people to be worried about right now. And I think for a lot of people, journalists are at the bottom of their list. And I do understand where that comes from, but you know, reporters are the backbone of, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of what we need right now. We need uh, openness, we need criticism. We desperately need people to hold the government to account. Um, and I worry that, that unfortunately, there'll be even less of that going on than, than there already is now. So in summary, journalists, not perfect, but better than not having them. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, yeah, that is so true. Uh, I think journalists rank bottom in terms of trust among all the professions. I think we can still call ourselves a profession. I'm not sure what they do at the sun, but anyway. <laughs> um, and our next speaker is um, John Lister, who's uh, also, I think, a professor of health journalism at Coventry. Is that right, John? Well, I'd love to be a professor. As well as, well as um, being a campaigner. Uh, as a new health journalism. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <I've... laughs> and um, he po points me to, uh, to a shout out for a resource for health journalists, uh, www free resource, europeanhealthjournalism.com. It's a useful um, source of trusted information. John. Yeah, th thanks for mentioning that. Yes, it, it is a free resource and uh, it came out of uh, a European uh, project actually on health journalism that I was uh, involved in through, through Coventry University. Um, uh, and uh, one of the things we discovered in that uh, research for that um, project was that uh, uh, and we did a survey and we found that most health reporting on virtually all the mainstream press is done by people with no specialist uh, training or skills in uh, health issues or in science issues. And I think that sometimes shows up. 
I mean, obviously, some self-taught journalists do extremely well. Uh, uh, and uh, we can point to a number of them that came through the local press. And I think the most obvious example, award-winning journalist on The Independent, Sean Linton, uh, who came through the, uh, from the local press where he broke the story of the, uh, of the scandal of the Mid-Staffordshire hospitals uh, into the Health Service Journal, where he developed his, his skills and is now the health correspondent on The Independent and breaking all kinds of very important stories there relevant to the current uh, thing, so uh, uh, the current crisis. So I, I think it's not guaranteed, it, it, just because you don't have training in it to start with doesn't mean you can't do it. But it does mean that if we expect all journalists simply to be able to accurately report, particularly scientific aspects of the, of the crisis, uh, and, and to necessarily even find what the right questions are, then we, we might be expecting too much. And certainly when the amount of time that people have in very, uh, restricted um, staffing on newsrooms, uh, the amount of time people have to research stories it can be limited as well. So, uh, and I speak as somebody, I've been 36 years as a, a specialist health journalist myself, uh, mainly as a campaigner, but as uh, in, in, in doing that as evidence-based campaigning and seeking to base everything on, 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 on research and on, on, on thorough checking of facts and so forth. Um, I've always actually studiously avoided writing stuff about uh, health uh, as, as such, medicine in particular, and science uh, also. I, I've always tried to focus on policy issues, but clearly at the present time, we've got to be able to do a bit of each, and we've got to have regard for the science as we actually do the reporting. And I, so I think all of us who are coming at this from a non-scientific background have to, have to look at those, those type of things. And I think one of the things is that if you look at the standard uh, problems, if you look at people reporting drug research or breakthroughs and this, that or the other uh, in terms of science, a lot of what journalists pick up in terms of press releases that gets them onto these stories in the first place has already been distorted by PR um, uh, people actually from the institutions and the research uh, bodies actually producing the, 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 the information in the first place. So the scientists may well produce a fairly lengthy and fairly uh, intricately worded uh, nuanced report about the findings and say, well, they may, may well in the, in the future turn out to be you know, offering possibilities of solving cancer or whatever. By the time the PR department have tried to angle it to get some coverage in the mainstream press, most of those nuances have been stripped away and you're looking for the most sensational aspects to actually put forward. And by the time the journalists who don't understand the issues and probably haven't bothered to look up the original paper, even if they're aware it exists, and have picked up the press release and told to write a story in a very limited amount of time. And by the way, make sure you get lots of clicks uh, for your advertisers while you're actually uh, putting a story together. Then the, the, the question of the nuances and the actual uh, original balance of the research is, is probably almost certainly lost. And I think some of that comes over in the way that uh, some of the stories about the uh, the, 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 the virus itself were initially misreported, and it can be very difficult if you don't know which experts to listen to and which not to. The government itself, clearly, you know, guided by the science, but it's obviously some of the scientists they've been listening to are clearly not the right ones if they really have been guided by the science. Um, journalists are not necessarily going to be any better at it than the, than, than the politicians. So I think we need to uh, uh, start from some basics. The, the, the job of a journalist, I think uh, Charlotte touched on this, the job of a journalist is not uh, simply to echo what a press release says or to echo what the government's uh, latest pronouncements might be, even if we can work out what they are in the case of Johnson's latest uh, efforts over the weekend. Uh, it's not to do that, it's to probe behind that and to ask meaningful questions to raise a critical approach to that that can better inform the reader. Otherwise, all you're doing is a, a stenographer just rattling out and cut and paste some press release and turn it into an article, which doesn't actually leave anybody any the wiser at all. So the starting point of that has to be, you know, and, and when we look at some of the report, in particular, I would say some of the worst of the BBC reporting of, of, of the Johnson government's uh, various actions over the COVID thing, it seems like the, uh, the government and, and some of the reporting has taken more of a leaf out of the North Korean propaganda book and um, PR book than the South Korean public health book. You know, instead of asking questions based on what international best practice actually is, which you can find relatively easily by simply uh, trawling around on the Internet, it's not difficult to find. Instead of that, we're just par parroting what the government says. So when the government says, Matt Hancock says we tested 122,000 cases. The first action of the BBC is to say, 
120, uh, BBC uh, 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 government exceeds 100,000 target for testing. Only later do they go back, and even, it's actually the BBC's own reality check had to come in and reality check their own report and say, look, actually 40,000 of these were only tests that were sent out in the post, and these aren't tests that are actually performed. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the whole thing over the weekend with the street parties for VE Day, and the BBC encouraging these things and reporting the big gatherings that were there, which clearly ignored social distancing and were clearly a major actual public health threat, and reporting them like it's a great uh, exuberance of patriotism. Again, completely unaware of actually the, the, the implications of what they were doing in terms of the context. So I think, I think we need to, uh, we need to uh, say journalists need to approach these things with a view that we're in the midst of the biggest ever crisis, we've got to learn some new things and we've got to then apply them to everything we do in terms of the reporting that, that goes on. If we look again, uh, we need to read enough of the background to know what's going on and not all of it is that difficult to read. I've just been a, a scientist friend of ours just sent us over a couple of really good articles from Nature magazine, uh, which is relatively easy to access and, and easy to understand. There's some really excellent stuff has been in New Scientist, some really good stuff in fr from the WHO itself is putting out some really good background information and some statistics that are relatively easy to understand. The point out, for example, that while we might be second in total deaths uh, across the world to uh, the USA, in terms of deaths per head, we're way out at, at the top of the league, a league that nobody wants to be the top of. We are streets ahead of, 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 of other countries. Uh, and, and, and that, you know, that is the deaths per head, deaths per million population is the measure we should be bringing to bear because we've got lots of different countries, different ways of reporting. Um, some report absolutely all deaths that possibly could be COVID. It seems in this country, we've got doctors encouraged not to report COVID wherever, wherever they can possibly find a reason not to. Um, so we can't necessarily compare all the totals one to the other. But what we can do is look roughly at the, at the deaths per head per, per, per million, and we can actually use that as a meaningful comparison, despite Johnson government obviously saying, oh, it's too early for international comparison. I don't know what, what, what the right time is for international comparisons after everybody's dead, I suppose. You, you just come back and count up afterwards. Uh, so read enough background. Take, take a little bit of time. You might even have to do time that's not actually at the desk in, 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 in the formal work hours. But to make sure you're on top of the brief, if you're, if you're working as a health reporter, do find out enough to be able to do the job properly. And, and again, I do think a lot of journalists have been trying to do that, and, and some local press as well, so doing some excellent stuff. And when it comes on to uh, uh, evidence-based reporting, there's again some basics. Now, just, just for journalists who are not aware of it, this is a really excellent book. This is, it looks, comes out uh, wrong way around in my uh, film. It's News and Numbers. It's Victor Cohn and Lewis Cope, and it's available. It's Wiley Blackwell. You can buy it on the internet. And this actually gives you some background to understand statistics and you know comparing risk in you know, some of these questions are, are actually really but fairly basic but it's something that lots and lots of journalists get wrong and uh, and correlation and, and connection of, of different events for example um, you know it, uh, th there's no correlation necessarily between global warming and the decline of piracy they both took place over the same period of time but they're not actually necessarily linked to each other uh, Things like that, we can get some of these things wrong in reporting and we can mislead people by making connections that aren't necessarily correct. We can misuse percentages when then it's not appropriate to use percentages. We can forget the scale of different things. You can have a big increase in a very small number uh, that doesn't actually make much difference to anybody. You can have a relatively small increase in a very large number. You know, we're talking about whether it's 1%, 2%, 3% of the population is not asymptomatic with, with COVID. Right. Well, three percent of seventy million is actually still a very large number of people, and it's very significant if if it's three percent. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but until you actually do the calculations, so it's worth keeping those things in mind and have a a look through that 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 book on that. And the underlying point is only by good critical reporting can we really empower the public uh, to, to, with the knowledge of what's going on and the power, therefore, to raise their voices and try to bring pressure on the government to do the right thing. So if good reporting is key to actually ensuring that the, uh, the public and, and, and the political life of this country has a healthy uh, response to a, a dreadful disease in a, in a period of the biggest crisis I think any of us have seen. Thank you very much, John.
some very powerful statements and extremely useful information um, to arm working journalists and others trying to make sense of the uh, output from the media and actually to make sense of the actual of the coronavirus itself and the pandemic. Okay, great. Um, we've had lots of really interesting questions. Um, so I'll take the speakers in the order in which you were called originally. So if you've got pen and paper to hand, I'll um, present three questions to you. Uh, the first is from Henry Widass, who's at the Lancashire Post. And this relates to something people have been talking about. Um, should teaching unions, the NEJ and journalists be asking if the lockdown itself is doing more harm than good in terms of education, jobs and the economic crash that according to many experts will lead to even more deaths when the, when the virus itself? Give me a moment to gather your thoughts on that one. I'll get to the next question. Um, I'll take two together actually because they're kind of, they're, they sort of overlap. I'd rather follow the science than follow Boris Johnson, but shouldn't journalists be skeptical of everyone who dubs themselves an expert? And a question that relates to that, who are the scientists, in inverted commas, that stand next to government ministers every day? Like, are they really scientists or political place people? So that relates to those people we see uh, at the briefing every day. So I'll start with uh, John Parrington from Oxford Uni. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we can't stress enough, really, in thinking about these things, just, just how serious a disease this is. I think that's why we've had to learn as we went along about the fact that there's wider layers of people out there that are vulnerable. And I think that's particularly why we've got to be so um, strong about, about exactly why we, we, we can't have it in, in you know, a, a, a too soon a, an easing of the lockdown. So, so this whole point then about how is um, the lockdown affecting people? Is this going to itself have big implications? Well, clearly it, it's hitting people in all sorts of ways. And I think one of the things that we can say, yeah, the effects on mental health, the effects on people who've actually literally just lost their job and life and the rest of it are incredibly big questions and we can't duck them. And I suspect that Boris Johnson and his, and his government will, will try and play on these divisions. I, I, I think what we really have to keep pointing the finger back at the government is to say, well, look, it's your role to protect those people that are being affected by the lockdown. That is, you know, you've thrown billions at, you know, businesses and the rest of it, but it has to go to ordinary people. So I think this has always got to be a critical thing. But the problem is, is that if we come out of the lockdown, you know, too soon, and then we have to start all over again, that in itself is not helping anybody. Is it? So I think that's a key thing. Um, you know, wh who, what is an expert? Well, I think that's an interesting question in itself because even, you know, top virologists have had to learn lots of interesting things and uh, worrying things about this virus. You know, the fact that we we've learned that uh, unusually when people go into a really serious case of COVID, um, the normal mechanisms in, in, in that the would normally make us breathe more, you know, they try and get oxygen into our bodies doesn't often seem to work. So there's this silent hypoxia. It's a really worrying uh, symptom for the serious case because it means that they can have massive drops in, in oxygen levels in the body without showing any, any obvious signs. And that means, first of all, they're far more likely to die. And I think it, would, it means we're looking at whole, like echoing what Megan said, that some of the people who've been through a really serious COVID case are by no means fine and, 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 and you know, ready to, to go again. There's a real potential for massive implications of that in, in terms of people's health. You know, is there going to be brain damage? Is it going to have other implications on the body? And I think that's, again, where we have to really uh, stress the seriousness um, of the uh, of, of what we're looking at in this pandemic. In, yeah, it may be in, in most people, it may have very limited impact, but clearly in the people who are vulnerable, and, and as John said, that is still a massively significant number of people. It's an incredibly serious disease. And I think thinking about you know, if I was approaching this as a journalist, um, I think two things would be important. One is to to really keep an, uh, ahead of the science and, and really looking at the change in science and, and trying to use that to point the finger at what the government's not doing. I think also highlighting some of the things that people may take for granted. I mean, you know, why is it that we, we don't have mass testing? In a country that has the infrastructure, has the molecular biology, it's absolutely scandalous that we don't have a system set up already that could allow us to 
to, to test mass numbers of people. You know, why do we not have the, the, a drug that could be used to tackle this virus? The fact is we had MERS, we had the, the previous SARS uh, epidemic. They should have been a warning to us all that we needed to start developing the drugs and the infrastructure to make the vaccines for exactly what, what this pandemic that, that we, we've now got. And I think that in itself is something we should be pointing the finger at, the, 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 the fact that the scientific establishment itself hasn't been prepared. It's far too closely linked to government. Um, and these are really important points to make. But I think also we do need to be angry. We, journalists, I think, need to be angry. And they need to be looking at um, people as, you know, it's not just figures, but there's human beings at the end of all this. I mean, one of the, I think, the most... Uh, scandalous things about this whole situation in the UK is the fact that people in care homes, you know, all these heroes from the Second World War and whatever, are, are, are basically just being left at the mercy of the um, the virus. And, 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 you know, there's been some interesting articles, actually. I mean, I don't normally read the Daily Mail, but the Daily Mail has actually had some quite good sort of uh, human sort of interest articles on, on the virus. And one of them that really touched me was the fact that, you know, some, some health um, some hospitals have been basically um, dumping people, elderly people from care homes who've gone into hospital and then bringing them back to the care homes at early hours in the morning when it's very difficult for the, for the care home to turn them away. You know, absolutely scandalous behaviour. So I think we can point the finger in a number of directions, not just the government, actually, some of the ways in which the health care system itself, the people at the top, are trying to cover up what's you know some 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 of the, the lack of PPE, the fact that these practices are essentially uh, you know having a massive impact on, on people in the care homes um, is an important thing. And I think that kind of human angle is important. The anger is important. You know, who would have thought that Piers Morgan would become a sort of champion uh, of, of the, the you know people who uh, against the government in in this sort of sense? Who, who would have thought you know Matt Lucas would uh, would would suddenly be, strike a chord when he when he ridiculed the way the, the, the Prime Minister um, made his speech the other day. So I, th I think these things all matter. The human angle is important. And, and I certainly learned that in my very limited stretch as a journalist, that, that those kind of human angles are as important as the, um, you know, as the reporting of the facts and the figures. Um, but certainly, the, I think in terms of, just to wrap up really, in terms of scientists themselves, well, clearly there are scientists and scientists. And I don't really consider some of the people who've been fronting for the government to, to really be playing the proper role of scientists. Having said that, you know, there are advisors um, in the SAGE group who I think have got good scientific credentials. I think one of the problems is, is that scientists can be, uh, can be used in that way. And yet, and yet when it comes to the government, they completely ignore their advice. And it's up to scientists themselves to actually say, well, look, this is not, this is not right. This is not the way that scientists should be behaving. There should be more critical angles. There should be more anger. And that's the sort of thing why interviewing individual scientists and getting their opinion, you'll find that many academic scientists are in a position to, you know, to be quite outspoken about what they think. These are all angles that I think could add to a, a news report uh, rather than just, you know, as, as, as John said, just, just basically reporting the press release and, and not much more than that. So human angles in terms of the people who are dying from this disease, but also the fact that scientists themselves are humans and they've got opinions and they've got anger and all these things. And we need to channel that if we're going to make our, news reports really, 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 really uh, connect with people. Thank you, John. Megan from Leeds Uni. Okay, um, taking the second question first, should journalists be skeptical of the science? Well, absolutely, 100%. And I, I think it, this isn't or necessarily very difficult. I mean, I, I, in, in my introduction, I gave the example of the, what I regard as miscategorization of teachers in the ONS report uh, that uh, it probably came out yesterday, actually, rather than, than today, um, where, um, uh, which completely ignored the realities of teaching in reception classes. So that, to be honest, any class, uh, you know, the idea of PPE and social distancing is uh, something of a joke in, in uh, schools. So, yes, certainly take the science seriously, but don't believe it. You know, don't just accept it uh, um, without thinking through uh, the paradoxes, the possible paradoxes and so on that are there, um, particularly if... If the if the research that's being quote is being quoted out of context, um, 
the, the first question, should teaching unions be um, kind of um, asking if the, the lockdown, in other words, is, this, is the cure worse than the disease? Um, well, I, I, uh, I mean, I think you, you have to address this because this is the argument being put by the uh, herd immunity people, you know, the epidemiologist in Sweden, actually in, in an article defending his position, I think it was in the Financial Times two days ago, actually said, said this. Now, uh, you know, well, I, I suppose there is a faint possibility that it, it could be worse. I mean, a, a very faint. The problem is that this disease really has the potential to wipe out a large proportion of humanity. We haven't, we don't understand it. We can't calculate the risks. And therefore, where we have some control, for example, over transmission rates, where the lockdown actually reduces the transmission rates, we have some control. And what they're arguing for by saying, well, the economic impact will be worse, is they're for, for swearing any control over this pandemic. And um, to me, that is, a, a, I mean, irresponsible is, is really, uh, it, it, a mild word, this is criminal um, behaviour. Um, we should certainly address the argument, but um, I don't think the teaching unions should, it, by any stretch of the imagination, be asking that question because it is being used to undermine the lockdown. It's being used to push teachers back to school. It's being used to push workers into dangerous situations in order to make money for rich people who are safely um, distanced on their estates. And then finally, the question about who are the scientists? I mean, this, this is an interesting one because um, many of these scientists start off as kind of good scientists working in the lab, and then they get promoted up the organization. I mean, um, and then end up in the boardroom. And the boardroom is a different place to a university lab or even an industrial lab, a very, very different place. And there the boardroom, the discourse is totally dominated by profit accumulation and exploitation. And the science, the science is simply an adjunct to all of that. It's the, the science will come in through a discussion about how can we make more profit? How can we reduce the costs and so on? It, it, and you know, also there's the precautionary principle which has been lost in all of this. You know, the, um, if you're taking a risk and you don't fully understand the risks, you should act very, very cautiously. I mean, um, I, mean uh, I mean, there've been a number of examples of this, but I, I don't want to go on and on. Um, and finally, there's the revolving door. And um, the revolving door interchanges civil servants with people from boardrooms like British Aerospace, industry, and so on. And by the time a scientist ends up in this situation, they're thoroughly imbued with the corporate view. And Philip Valence, is a prime, prime example, where basically he's anti-science. He's, he's ended up as a, as a pseudo-scientist. End. Thank you very much, Megan. Um, pseudo-scientist, chief medical officer. That's interesting, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> um, right, over to Charlotte. We're running a bit short of time, but I'm, I'm sure you can get to the pertinent points, Charlotte. And then I'll John. be brief. Okay. Thank you, so John. the first question was about the risk of the lockdown causing more deaths than the disease itself. And I've, I've actually heard this one quite a few times. It's a talking point that seems to have come from right wing circles in the US. Uh, it's it's a, an argument lots of Republican politicians have made. And it's based on a now debunked study, which basically said that during an economic crisis, uh, crisis with every drop in GDP, it causes this number of deaths. 
it turns out that's that's a lot less reliable um, than was being suggested. So no, I don't worry about that. I we have very I'll put it this way: we have very clear evidence that there's a disease that kills people, and there are very concrete things we can do to stop that from happening. So let's do those <laughs> rather than worrying about you know is this causing a bit a bit of GDP to be shaved off, and is that going to hurt people? Let's focus on saving lives now. Uh, that should that should be the priority in my mind of any government and any any leader um, in any situation. Um, so yes, um, I hope I hope that hasn't incensed the person that asked the question. Um, the next question was was around kind of you know shouldn't we be skeptical of people who call themselves experts? Absolutely. I, I mean, most most real experts don't go around calling themselves experts. Um, so so yes, I, for sure. I mean, I I interview. A huge part of my job is interviewing um, academics uh, and interviewing people who know a huge amount about a particular scientific field. So whether that's trauma or sleep or I don't know cell biology, it could be it could be all sorts of things. Um, and often the best people are, funnily enough, the ones who don't really want to talk to you um, because they're very busy. They're not they're not basically in it for um, for their own egos, which you get plenty of media spokespeople are. Um, so it really it's on, on the part of journalists to do the research to find out who are the best people in that field. So look at academic papers, who's been cited a lot, who's, you know, who, whose research is, is the most respected um, in the field and, and who's kind of uh, producing some really cutting edge, interesting research as well. So, yeah, absolutely be sceptical of people calling themselves experts and just put in that bit of extra work to find um, scientists who who haven't been in the media as much frankly also try and find more women more ethnic minority people more more people from underrepresented groups and and interview them as well because uh, that's that's definitely an, an issue that people just interview the same people again and again that's my two cents worth that was very disciplined charlotte um thank you very much uh we'll come with another round of questions but quick fire ones but before we do that john lister Thank you. Uh, I, I agree with, every, I think, everything everybody said, but uh, in terms of the lockdown, I just point you to Greece, uh, where they started with a, a, a much weaker economy, but they instituted the lockdown almost immediately. Uh, the, there was the first sign of the, uh, of the uh, epidemic there, and they have a, a negligible death toll compared to any other country. And uh, so I, I think that that, that, that just speaks for itself, I think. Uh, what, what I would point out in terms of a Un unreported, so sort of largely un undiscussed area of the lockdown is the, the massive um, effort uh, changes that were made in the NHS to actually prepare for the uh, for the uh, virus. And uh, so we had this huge process of emptying out 30,000, 33,000 NHS beds, most but all of which are now still empty. Actually, we got some something like 40,000 beds empty at the, at the last count across the NHS. Um, all elective surgery pretty much stopped, including cancer treatments and various other treatments. Um, um, and, and outpatient appointments have been uh, uh, either cancelled or, or, or urgent ones have been turned over to uh, telephone triage uh, types, uh, type uh, um, uh, appointments. And that means that, that we've got and we've had a massive reduction also in the number of people that are turning up with even the most uh, the, the things you would expect people to go to A&E with, so, you know, de um, uh, coronary conditions, uh, strokes, and so forth. This raises the question of the hidden toll of non-COVID deaths, which have come out of this, of this virus, and the way that the NHS has chosen to respond to it. Now, I'm not sure that necessarily all of that was um, provably not the right way in the first place, but I do think that they've been a long time correcting it, um, I've just seen a document from the NHS talking about maybe moving towards restoring normal electives uh, treatment in 12 months time. Well, I mean, that's a hell of a long time without, you know, with the waiting list building up and so forth. And people with not necessarily life threatening, but uh, mobility threatening and, and life uh, debilitating uh, conditions are going to be uh, held waiting for, for a prolonged period. So I, I do think there's that hidden cost. There's also the total, we don't, still don't know, the number of people in mental health hospitals that have caught COVID and, 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 and mental health facilities, uh, the number of people with learning difficulties, there's a whole other group. So, and we had the care homes, it was a very delayed figure. We don't know what the, uh, what the hidden figures are there. 
Um, now they're not because of the lockdown, but they're because of, of, of the fact that the, 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 the disease is virulent and does need special measures to deal with it. Uh, just on the on the other question about the um, the experts, I, I would uh, flag up the question of the independent sage that was set up um, after, after it became increasingly obvious the uh, the actual official sage A was reluctant, profoundly reluctant to release any evidence or information as to who was on it, and B re re produce any of the information that they've been given to government, um, and uh, uh, raising serious questions about what the caliber of that information is. And it turns out that, you know, upwards, I think, of about 14 or 15 of them are actually government employees and are most unlikely to take a line that was actually completely independent of what the government wanted to hear. Um, and although it's a large committee, I'm not sure how, what, we don't know what proportion of them attend a particular meeting. So it might be that proportion of government employees are there at every meeting and actually quite a considerable um, uh, influence on what's actually said and of course we've got Dominic Cummings sitting in there uh, a noted scientist uh, with, with, with huge credentials in terms of his uh, objective understanding of the of the, uh, of the of the of the of the science of the situation and of course his his mate who designs uh, software systems and so forth and, uh, la uh, and, and his brother who landed a contract for uh, designing the testing and tracing uh, app and so forth which has all kinds of questions about it so these people are sitting in on the on the official uh, meetings and, and we have to question necessarily therefore what, what the caliber is of what we're getting out of it meanwhile an independent sage was set up by a former uh, chief uh, scientific officer uh, sir david king and has got some really interesting people on there who are experts and i think they should they should be recognized as experts john ashton uh, alison pollock some of these people who are public health experts they, they're, they're, they're long, long standing uh, training the principles of public health, which are being ignored by the government. So rather than set up their testing and tracing by working uh, with the existing networks of, uh, of, 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 of uh, local government staff, there's 5,000 of them who are, are trained to test, uh, track, and trace uh, people in, 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 in around uh, um, environmental health and, and disease. Uh, rather than go to them, we're, we're apparently getting Circo, a private company. Uh, to recruit people to run call centres uh, and give them one day's training and set up what's apparently going to be a, a, a parallel government structure. Now, this is just crazy. This is not listening to the science. This isn't listening to the experts. This is actually simply deciding a private sector solution is the answer because that's the way the government ideologically looks. And so I, I do think we have to say some people are experts here and we should listen to them. Um, at the present time, that's being done through independence stage rather than by the government's committee. Thank you very much, John. Um, okay, I've got a couple of quick fire questions, which is really unfair of our guest speakers tonight, because they're quite hard questions, I guess, um, that aren't, uh, maybe can't be answered in two seconds, <laughs> but give it a go. <laughs> and a couple of sentences. Uh, can science ever be objective? I think we've all heard that question before. And one I haven't heard before, should scientific research be nationalised? given they seem to be nationalizing everything else, like debt and what's like. Right. Um, anyway, so I'll take uh, John Parrington first. Sorry, John, I dropped you right in it. Trying to give a two sentence answer to those big questions. This, are you muted? Yeah, I'm now muted, yeah? Um, yeah you are. I think that uh, science should be objective because um, the whole point of doing science is to learn the truths about the real world. But the fact is, we do science in a particular kind of society, capitalist society. There's a huge amount of influences and pressures from the society, not just in terms of who funds us, but also in terms of ideological pressures. So I think that um, it's a bit of both, really. You've got to look at who's uh, doing the science, who's funding them, you know, what other views they've got, all these things kind of matter. But yeah, I think it's best science is objective and it's always willing to learn and find out new things about the world and i think that's what's been important about the covid crisis we've learned all sorts of things about the virus but also about the kind of problems in our whole society about what does work and what doesn't and, and i think that's why we have to be very searching and talking about um the uh, the, pr the problem with, with which have now arisen they weren't inevitable ones it wasn't inevitable this virus was spread around the world it wasn't inevitable we would have no mass testing in place. It wasn't inevitable we wouldn't have a drug and a vaccine already almost there. And these things are all really important points. So it's as much about 
the, the, the sociology of science as about the actual practice of science itself. Um, shall I answer the second or maybe I should leave that for someone else? Maybe Megan can jump on the second. The nationalisation question. That's an interesting one, given all of the nationalism that might be getting in the way of uh, getting a virus, um, getting the virus bought. Okay. Um, Nationalise. I mean, I, I, I think a lot of research is carried out in the universities. Um, we should break the market model of education and re abolish student fees and return to uh, national funding of universities. Um, and that will um, uh, begin to achieve a more objective type of, of research because currently those of us who are active researchers and run labs, we have to chase the money all the time. And you are, you are bound to the people that are deciding who's giving you the money. Now, before the market model, that was a problem. Um, so I think that aspect needs to be addressed. In terms of industrial research, I think this is about bringing industry into public ownership. So I suppose in that sense, yes, nationalized. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's about research um, for public need. And actually, pure research, you know, are just chasing ideas is a, a satisfying and a necessary human activity. The problem is that the world we live in is dehumanizing the whole process, or the whole social process whereby scientific objectivity is obtained. Charlotte? Um, I think that I will just take, um, I can't remember if it was the first or the second question there, but anyway, the question about, about science and, and bias, um, I think that's a difficult one because, you know, science is uh, made by humans, humans do have their own biases. I mean, scientists inevitably want their own hypothesis to be true. Um, and, and of course, stepping away from that and saying, no, we haven't found what I thought we'd find is, is really difficult and can be very, very gutting. Uh, but crucially, they have to publish their methods, they have to publish their findings, that's we opened up for peer review. Um, so it, it is a process that does help to flush out um, anything that isn't correct. That process is being rushed a bit now, um, incidentally, uh, understandably, because we need to know what's going on with uh, with the virus, but um, I think that on the whole, I, I have got more faith in most scientists than I do in most politicians, having covered both and spoken to both. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charlotte. John, would you like to get in a few words? Yeah, I, th I think that in terms of science being objective, it was great. It'd be great if you could just detach it from the class society we're actually in but I think it was uh, Marx that said that uh, you know the ruling ideas of society are those uh, from the, those who own the means of production and uh, and 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 you know there's a de definite connection between the ability to help develop ideas sponsor the the research into particular uh, areas of work and then take those ideas and generalize them, spread them um, 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 and so forth through the mass media, through uh, publication, through promotion uh, um, and through actually transforming them in then into processes, which clearly can't be completely detached from the, the society we're in. So, uh, you know, again, science itself might actually theoretically be objective, but whether or not um, uh, and and uh, you can see that most, I think, glaringly in the United States with the sort of anti-science Trump regime just, uh, you know, really, really looking completely unfavorably at almost anybody that says anything that's remotely um, critical or actually remotely progressive, actually, in the United States at the present time. Um, when it comes on to nationalizing research, yes, we, we need state funding. Uh, to actually take that forward. The Medical Research Council, for example, which uh, pioneered a lot of early work in the, uh, under the early NHS, uh, was, was a, uh, remains still a publicly owned uh, body, but it certainly could be doing a lot more if it had the resources and was able to then sponsor work through the universities 
and the universities instead of having to go to the uh, big pharma and the other, other you know the major companies could actually look for government sources of funding and you could actually get resources that would then be publicly owned and in the public domain rather than uh, patented by private companies for for, for profit so yes i, I, I think there would be a benefit there uh, I think nationalizing science makes it sound like some kind of repressive uh, situation. I think it would be a tremendous liberation for a lot of scientists not to have to follow the, uh, the quest for profit of large companies rather than, uh, the, than the needs of, of science. And certainly when it comes to re researching drugs uh, for, for the example, the developing world and things like this, then you know, the only way to do that is by putting in uh, money that is not directly tied to the, the quest for profit. Thank you very much, John. And thanks to all of the speakers tonight who have been very informative and, and lucid and have provided a great resource, not just for journalists, I would say, but for anyone who's following uh, this pandemic, how it's been reported and the truth about what we can and cannot do about it. Um, so again, thank you very much. And I'm going to bring proceedings to um, our folks. But before I do so, some quick announcements. We have a coffee coffee morning, I should say that's obviously a virtual coffee morning on Zoom at 11 a.m. this Saturday, and that'll be happening every Saturday as we go forward. Um, the last meeting was very productive. We've uh, got a poster with lots of demands on them. I won't go through the demands now, but the poster will be posted shortly after this meeting in the group and also on the page, so get along and have a look. Um, and also, um, Talk about the next meeting of course uh, our next meeting which is on pandemics profits and the media we need and we're very pleased to um have ken loach i, I think could be described as britain's foremost uh, film director who will be joining us um and also possibly britain's foremost documentary film producer uh chris hurd who's uh, also um was the editor of insight for those of us who uh a little bit older, remember the insights uh, of the Sunday Times um, re investigative reporting reporting team, which uh, developed um, some really high level stories and has world renown. He headed up that team um, and has gone on to found the, um, I think it's the Sheffield Film Documentary Festival um, as well. So they'll both be speaking next week, Monday, the 18th at 7 p.m. on Facebook Live and it'll be recorded and so you'll be able to watch it on the YouTube channel also, if that goes for tonight's meeting as well. So thanks everyone for um, beaming in. Is, is that what you do, beaming or logging on? Um, and thanks again to all of our speakers. So that's John Parrington from Oxford Uni, Megan Povey from Leeds Uni, Charlotte G from MIT Technology Review. Um, and you can read their stuff at technologyreview.com, the correct URL and John Lister, um, who's also uh, an academic, but he's also a health campaigner for many years standing. Online meeting, pandemic, profits, and the media we need, with keynote speakers Ken Loach, filmmaker, and Christopher Hurd from Dartmouth Films, Monday, 18th of May, Facebook Live, 7 p.m. Visit our Facebook page for the broadcast, bit.ly slash 2z2ic uppercase UK.